and welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Now, today we're going to have a look at what's forthcoming at the World Sudoku Championship, which starts in Prague on Monday. Um, and at the beginning of last week, the organisers sent out what's called the instruction book, which contains details here of um, the rounds, the schedule. So, as you can see from the schedule, over the two days there are... 10 individual rounds, three team rounds, and some playoffs. Um, then come the competition rules, which are fairly straightforward. Um, there are some bonus points for people who finish rounds early. And, um, and the rules for the playoffs. Apparently there are team playoffs this year. I think that's the first time that's happened. Uh, no, it probably isn't, actually. No, there's always team playoffs, what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, so what what the point of this is, is to show you the sort of puzzles that you get. Now, round one, these are not really different puzzle types, which is why they're not in bold. They're just um, puzzle types reflecting the various rounds, something about the the classic Sudoku's here, and it'll be the shape of the Gibbons will represent these various years that it's taking part. So if you see, one of these years is Beijing 2013, and in this grid, this example grid that they show, it looks like the Gibbons are in the shape of a one and a three. Now it's quite clever to be able to create a puzzle like that, um, that's solvable, um, but it doesn't really affect the solving, what, what the kind of puzzle looks like at first glance. Now, round two is where we start with the variants. And most of what a World Sudoku Championship is about is variant Sudoku. That round of classic Sudokus, after that, there won't be many classic Sudokus to solve. And although we spend all this time giving you advice, which is pretty much always on classic Sudokus, that's only part of the toolkit you need to solve these puzzles. So here we can see that in this round, 45 minutes, there are 10 puzzles one could attempt. Um, which just has greater than and less than signs within each box. Um, and these, these are much the classic variants. Oh, sorry. Um, wow. So, consecutive Sudoku, where every instance of two consecutive digits is marked with a dot. So next to this 7, it can't be a 6 here because of the 6 in the box and the row, so that must be an 8. And they publish the solution here, which shows that that deduction's right. And, of course, putting markings in the grid like that often enables them to reduce the amount of givens dramatically. So here there are only 9 given numbers in the grid, but all the consecutive markers help. This is a fairly classic variant called diagonal, where there are diagonal lines in the grid which must also contain the numbers 1 to 9. That's not so for most classic Sudokus, so it's an important extra constraint. It really changes how you solve. This is an unusual one, I think, for, for a basic round called quadro. Within every 2 x two, 2 set of cells, you must have at least one odd digit and one even digit which kind of rules out little blocks of four odds or four evens together. Um, it's an unusual constraint. As you can see, there's a lot of givens in the example, and I think that would have to be true in the real puzzle as well. It's one of those, you often have to decide with these puzzles whether you start using normal Sudoku techniques and then move to the constraints a bit later, as you probably would in that puzzle, or whether you start with the constraints straight away. Um, this one is, is another classic. It appears in a number of newspapers in the UK occasionally as well, Windoku, where there are some extra regions always in these specific places as though they were windows um, in a house or something. And those extra regions, the little grey regions, must contain all of the numbers from 1 to 9 as well. Um, killer, which obviously we do know about, although in the world Sudoku variants there can be squares not in cages within the grid and in fact here they've even got little diagonal lines joining some of the cages which we're not used to seeing in most standard format. This one is called disjoint groups. Now the extra constraint here is that in every top left corner 
for instance, of a box, you get the nine different digits, again, from one to nine. Um, and the same is true for every position of square. So um, all the middle squares will be the different digits from one to nine. And that's quite hard constraint to work with. You kind of have to picture a different extra region for every cell position. That's not easy. We're getting up to the higher value puzzles in this round. This one's a bit of a classic variant as well, irregular. Now you don't have three by three square boxes. You have odd shapes in which all the numbers one to nine will be contained in each one. And then finally, is it finally? No, there's two more in this round. Jigsaw Killer, which has got quite hard to see in this, but it's got cages like a killer and it's got odd shapes like an irregular. And then finally, greater than and killer, which is a bit like the kind of greater than killers that we've been solving, for, solving from dailykillersudoku.com. But um, here there are greater than signs within the cages. So it's not cage values, it's comparing the number values within the cages. Um, it's the sort of puzzle that is probably reasonably straightforward logically, but it's extremely hard to see where you should be looking for the next logical move. Um, I really don't think greater than, less than signs are conducive to kind of good scanning and stuff. So I think that will be a very tough and it's the hardest one in the round for 90 points. Um, now let's just assess for that round there's a total of how many points available in what time? Um, it looks like 515 points in 45 minutes. So if you were thinking you might solve them all, you'd be expecting to achieve um, 10 points a minute, is it? About 12 points a minute. And that would require you to solve, say, the consecutive puzzle in two minutes. So it's really a tough ask to uh, expect anybody to complete that, that set. Now, the title here, FED Alternatives, I think refers to a Czech website where a lot of Sudokus are available. Um, I don't know whether it's subscription or not, but the, the FED, I think, is the Czech um, Sudoku organization and they've got a website where they've published these as standard alternatives and plenty of the others that we'll see in later rounds as less standard ones. So I won't go through the whole booklet now. Um, this is really just to give you an impression of, of what one's faced with but we'll have a look at the next round as well. Curtex Cup which far more points. The last round was for 515 points. This one's for 1,180 in 90 minutes. Again, the relationship seems to be somewhere around um, 12 points a minute, um, which again requires you to solve the classics. There are a couple of classics here in less than three minutes each to be on pace to finish the round. I mean, I don't think many, many of us there will be attempting that. And then, look at that, there's, after those two classics, there are 16 other variants to cope with. Um, and some of them, they admit, are for 110 points, I suppose that's taking nearly 10 minutes. So they haven't given classic examples. But you can have a look at these other ones. This one's XVs, where, again, relations between cells are marked. Any that add up to, any pair that adds up to 10 or 5 is shown by the Roman numeral. Um, that's quite useful and quite a familiar one, at least. To me. Never seen this before. Four pairs. There are two independent groups of eight cells in the grid marked with the grey shading. Exactly four different digits can be found in each of the groups, each of them exactly twice. So just checking what that means on the solution. We've got 5, 2, 1, 5, 1, 9, 2, 9. Two twos, two ones, two fives and two nines on that grey shading. That's a very unusual constraint. Quite a lot of givens there, so one could begin that with normal Sudoku logic, I expect. This one's called Irregular Dots. And here, 
the dots relate to these row numbers and column numbers outside the grid. If there's a white dot, the difference between the two cells it surrounds is the number outside the grid. So the difference between that cell and that cell will be one. And if there's a black dot, they add to those numbers outside the grid. So here you can see in this column five, that must be one and four and that two and three or the other way around. Now, I mean, for that puzzle to have so few givens, not even all that many black dots, that's going to be a tough puzzle. Um, just keeping going. Sequences. So within, on the grey lines are arithmetical sequences. They don't have to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They could be three, six, nine, as you can see. So a bit of maths coming in. In thermometers, which is fairly familiar, each thermometer starts with whatever the numbers on the thermometer, the lowest one is in the bulb, and then they work upwards like a thermometer. This football, this is a very odd variant. I mean, I've, I had to read this very carefully. I've never seen it before. There are two footballs in play. Um, the footballs are an eight and a nine, and I'll try and explain how this works. So looking at the nine first, from this circled one, the nine is here. So one is passing the nine to player two, who's passing the nine, which is next to him there, in a diagonal line up to player three. He's passing the nine to player four. He's passing the nine to player five. He's passing the nine to player six, and he's passing the nine to player seven. And there's a similar chain for the eights. That's a very peculiar idea. I don't know who came up with that, but um, I had a go at the puzzle. And once you get used to what it means, it's not that hard. It kind of breaks down into you work out the teams and then, then you can start filling in the grid. In Fortress, which again we are familiar with, any grey and white cell next to each other, the grey cell must be bigger. So it's kind of implying that the grey block is a fortress holding it out out against smaller numbers around it. Coded pairs, quite like this one oddly. Um, in the cage A, it must be the same two numbers in some order as in the other cage A. So information you get in one box suddenly helps you in another box in a completely different part of the grid. This detection, this looks monstrous to me. An arrow in a cell with digit N points to the direction where another digit N can be found. So if there's an arrow in a cell with a number in it, there must be an arrow in the diagonal proceeding down that direction. There must be another of those numbers in that diagonal. That's really weird. I mean, and so few givens, very difficult to solve in my opinion. Um, again, with a lot of these, if you can get the star, Often they're all about getting the start in the actual competition. Do have a go at that if you want, but um, let's just keep going. Elimination. If there's a dig oh, there's little grey arrows here that you may not be able to see on the screen. I can barely see them myself. Um, if there is a digit N in a cell with an arrow, then that digit can't appear in a direct in the diagonal direction the arrow is pointing at. So it's kind of the opposite of the previous one. Pretty tricky, I suspect, again. Non-consecutive spiral. I mean, this one, it's the same. The boxes are there. They're just marked in colours instead of lines. And that's so that the lines can show a spiral that goes throughout the grid. And along the spiral, you can't have consecutive digits next to each other. So this couldn't be a four up at the top here. In fact, it must be a one, funnily enough. But apart from that, it's extremely hard to make any deductions about this grid. And... I'm almost tempted to believe they haven't given enough information. It's an incredibly difficult solve. I hope for 85 points the actual um, version in the competition won't be quite that difficult. Here's another one with some odd markings I've never seen before. There's lots of those. Every, I mean, do read this if you want. Um, but it kind of means that if one of these here, this symbol has a 9 and a 5 pointing to it, and it's a 3, and that means that in the column that the 3 is in, the 9 and 5 must be 3 cells apart. Very weird um, rule, constraint. 
Another weird one here, clock faces, although I have seen this before. Four digits around a black circle are in an increasing order going anti-clockwise, and round a white circle they're increasing order going clockwise. So if you look at the solution, this white circle here has two, three, four, six going clockwise. Um, well, fair enough, but extremely hard to work that out. Um, all possible circles are marked, so that's one of the negative constraints. And you don't know which cell then the sequence will start in, where the lowest number will be. Killer 007. Um, this one, you don't use 1 to 9 anymore. You're using 1 to 7 and two zeros, and the killer, to the killer cage totals are given as usual. The two zeros can't be next to each. They can't share an edge, um, but they can be diagonally next to each other. Another strange one. This one, counting neighbours. I can't even remember what this is. A number in a cell with a circle tells you how many distinct digits you can find in the cells around it. And a number in a cell with a cross tells you how many are in the diagonal surrounds. So if there's a cross on the edge of the grid, it can't must be different. In fact, cross on the edge of a grid, and it's not in the corner, I think it must be a two. So that must be a two, and that must be a two, and that must be a two, and that must be a one. Because for instance, on this one here, it's pointing to that cell and that cell, and saying how many of those are different or distinct digits. And they must be distinct, because they're in the same row. So that seems to be a start for that puzzle, at least. But I mean, the, the point about, and I think this is the last one in the set, number five still alive. Um, the sum of all digits in every region ends with a five. So every time there's a cage, the cells in that cage add up to either five, 15, 25, 35, or 45. Can't be higher than that because no digit can be repeated in a cage. There you go. That's just rounds one to three. That'll be the morning of the first day of a two-day competition. And um, it's worth noting that in India last year, there were about 140 or 150 variants to learn. And it's looking like there'll be almost as many this time around. So quite a challenge for those of us going. Looking forward to it, but there's a lot to work through in this answer booklet. Not many days left. Um, I'll probably come back and uh, show you the rest of the booklet later. Um, thanks very much for watching and, uh, and wish me luck in Prague. Good to see you. Hope to see you again on Cracking Cryptic. Bye now.